So first of all, thank you very much for um, for uh, for the PEC Bio team to to invite me to talk at this uh, at this webinar. I'm really honored, and I'm happy to to explain about um, this um, project of my PhD, which I um, did at Uppsala University in the lab of Jochen Wolf. And um, yeah, so I'm just gonna jump right in and uh, talk about the uh, population genomics of structure variation in a songbird system. And before, um, um, okay, um, before I dive right in, I basically wanna wanna start some with some definitions. So, what is structural variation actually? And um, Maybe I start with uh, defining what a, what a SNP is, a single nucleotide polymorphism. And that's basically just a, a single nucleotide change in a focal sequence compared to a reference. So here on the left side, you can see the, the red C, that's basically a single nucleotide change. And um, although there's uh, multiple different uh, definitions for structure variation, in my, in my humble opinion, I think everything which is not a SNP could be considered as a structure variant. But in, in an essence, it's every, um, every time a large stretch of, uh, of the sequence is altered at once, so meaning an insertion or a deletion or an inverted part or a translocated part compared to a reference, that's a structure variation. And um, as I mentioned, there's different uh, definitions, especially regarding the size, but a common definition is everything apart 50 base pairs can be considered a structural variant. And um, I'm an evolutionary biologist, and I'm particularly interested in the effects of uh, structural variation on the phenotype of an organism. And mainly that is because the phenotype is actually where then the, the selection can act upon. And I've, I've uh, because of that, I've also put some um, examples from evolutionary biology here. The first is actually the, the textbook example for adaptation, uh, a, a butterfly called peppered moth. And um, during the Industrial Revolution in the UK, uh, trees got all black and suddenly um, butterflies, which had this black morph on the right, were in an advantage over the, the uh, pale morph. And uh, recently it has been shown that um, the, the dark morph is actually due to a structure variant. Uh, transposable element insertion causes this difference in, um, in phenotype, and that's why these uh, butterflies fared much better when the trees were black due to the smoke. Uh, in the bottom here is uh, an example from the, from the bird world, basically. So there's this uh, shorebird species called ruffs, and what's very interesting about these birds is that the males have three different morphs. So the, the, the three um, birds here on, in the bottom, that's not different species, that's just uh, males from the same species. And uh, not only the plumages uh, or like the, the outer appearance, the feathers are different, but also the behavior is different. And uh, it has been shown that um, this morph is tied to a five megabase inversion on one of the chromosome of the birds. So very uh, interesting effects of, of structure variation on the phenotype. Uh, obviously, there's also a uh, huge importance for medical uh, um, applications. So there's a lot of diseases caused by SVs, but I'm, I'm not going to go into that today. So, um, and um, the lab of Jochen Wolf in uh, Uppsala and now in Munich um, is particularly interested in uh, the process of speciation. So how new species uh, arise and what the genetic me mechanisms behind that is. And so the main system of the group is um, our crows, so songbird species um, of the genus Corvus. And, um, and what's very interesting about uh, these uh, group of songbirds is that um, the about 60 species of the genus um, are mostly uniformly black, so they have the typical crow uh, plumage pattern or feather color, all black, but um, independently in the phylogeny of this of the songbird group, there is um, black and gray and also black and white forms. And what's, what's even more interesting is that um, these, these uh, species occur 
together with a sister species with which is all black so you have this independently reoccurring um, black versus black and gray pattern and that's actually uh, the main su study system of the of the group the european crow hy hybrid zone where there's an all black carrying crow form and a black and gray hooded crow form and uh, the work previously done in the lab um, has uh, looked at that in more detail. So, and then um, these crow species, um, where the black form is in the west of Europe and the black and gray form is uh, in the east of Europe, basically, they do um, meet in the middle and hybridize in a rather narrow hybrid zone. So, but they don't completely intermingle and um, the, the distribution boundaries are rather sharply defined. So, basically, they they look like two species, they behave like two species, um, but when we look then at um, the genetic differentiation based on, on single nucleotide changes, we found out that they're actually um, genetically more or less the same. So genome-wide average uh, differentiation is only about 0.02, the FSD is a, is a measure for genetic differentiation, and only 80, 83 fixed uh, nucleotides out of a genome of 1.3 billion base pairs is uh, fixed, meaning that you have only eight, about 80 differences which are diagnostic for these two crows uh, populations. Um, and the, the work um, involving SNPs also has already indicated some involvement of uh, structural variation in this um, diverging plumage pattern, so keeping, keeping the two um, forms apart, basically. And that's when I uh, joined the lab. And uh, my main project was basically to look in detail uh, uh, at the role of structural variation in the crow system. And for this, we have compiled uh, a rather nice data set uh, comprising um, the full phylogenetic range of the, of the genus um, and also um, short read sequencing data, long read sequencing data and optical mapping data. Uh, but today I'm, I'm just gonna focus obviously on the, on the long read sequencing. Um, and um, yeah, that's what we basically compiled. Now you might ask a question, well, uh, if you have already short read sequencing data, why do you actually need long reads? Why, why uh, sequence more if you have already the data? And um, I've put together this like little sketch here to kind of illustrate the problem a bit uh, in more detail. Christian has already mentioned it a bit uh, briefly in the, in the introduction. But um, so here you have a reference and um, the sharp eye, the trained eye to the alignments can already spot in the middle, there's a tandem repeat. So the, the sequence AGGT is repeated multiple times here in the middle. So if you have now a short read, okay, in this case, it's a very short read of only three um, base pairs, but a short read which only contains um, subunits or units of the, of the tandem repeat array, you will not be able to map um, that particular read unambiguously to the reference. So here the AGG, AGG um, goes in multiple places in the reference. And that of course is a problem if you want to reliably detect variants. If we look at long reads on the other hand, here also the long read is not very long, but uh, it actually spans the, the tandem repeat you are able to anchor the, the read completely to the reference and are able to, to look at variation in, in your reads. And um, the, the technical term for this is um, how you actually do that is split read mapping. So basically um, you chop up your read in, in multiple uh, pieces and then look at where all these subparts uh, align. And in the case of insertion, um, you have basically just, when you look at your alignments in the, in the genome browser, you have um, the number of bases indicated in the insert as insertion. Here, for example, 2.3 uh, kilobases. Um, if you have a deletion, you have the following picture as that you have a read aligning up until a certain place. Then you have um, a sharp gap, basically, also evident in the coverage, in the sequence coverage here on top. And then the same read uh, goes on to be aligned on the other side of the, of the deletion, basically. And similarly, when you have an inversion in your reads, uh, the very same read, part of the very same read aligns forward, then part of the read aligns um, reverse complement, basically, or back, backwards. 
and then the the third part also aligns forward again so that's basically the the framework as to how you can detect uh, structural variation so much for the expectations reality obviously often looks very different and um, I'm not going to go into the detail, but this is basically um, uh, an example from the wild. And here on the left, there's a, a part uh, of a tandem, a tandemly inverted repeat. And it's just uh, a huge mess and leads to um, really crazy um, output in your genotypes and your structure variant calls. So short, to summarize that slide, that's how I often felt when I looked at these um, alignments. So we had to come up with a scheme to basically make our genotypes in particular more reliable. And luckily, lucky for us, we had this um, sampling across the entire genus. So we had large phylogenetic distances uh, within our data. And so we came up with, uh, with the idea to basically just filter out um, or remove variants uh, with genotypes indicating that the variants are segregating across the clades. So meaning that um, if you have a variant that is uh, polymorphic within the crow clade and polymorphic within the jackdaw clade, it's likely to be an error because over these li large um, phylogenetic distances, there should not be any segregating variation. And to further explain this, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I took this uh, really beautiful um, figure from Graham Coop's um, blog. And here, basically on the right, you can see that um, if you assume blue is jackdaw and, and uh, green is, is crow, um, you have no more mixing uh, variation at the end. So all your variants are sorted and variation is within the clades, but not between the clades anymore. And that basically uh, allows us to exclude these variants with, with, uh, which show uh, um, polymorphism, polymorphisms across the clades. And waiting for this slide to change. <clears throat> okay, sorry for this. Um, so here uh, is basically just the technical setup. Um, the black squares depict the variant in the data set and the white squares are uh, the reference. And um, all these examples here depict um, possibilities of excluded variants. So whenever in our genotypes for a given variant, we had these patterns, we were able to filter that out based on these basic uh, population genetic assumptions that you, that you don't have any variants um, segregating across clades and also no, no back mutations. Um, and that's basically uh, just an illustration how it then looked. On out of uh, our 33 individuals, we we filtered out about um, uh, so we, we we yielded about 47,000 variants, and we we removed on um, about 12% of these. And on the left here is basically just um, a graphical illustration of the genotypes across the chromosome. And as you can see, it goes all all over the place. Whereas um, when we apply the filter, it gets um, much cleaner, where um, within the crow clade and the jackdaw clade, respectively, um, the, the variants are, are fixed uh, for reference or, or uh, variant, uh, depending on which um, clade you look. Uh, now, I need to mention a major drawback of this approach, namely that um, with this approach, you, you're likely going to exclude hypermutable sites. So, and this approach basically assumes that there's no back mutation. So, whenever there's a mutation happening, you cannot go back to the original state. And that may be true for, for single nucleotide uh, changes, but maybe not so much for, for structural variants. And actually, if you have um, microsatellite arrays, for example, these are known to, to go back and forth. Uh, so that's that's a, a rather conservative approach to, to filtering. So that's something to keep in mind in this approach. So now that we had this uh, nice and uh, rather reliable set of, of variants with genotypes, we could go back to our original question, namely that we wanted to know which variants could be responsible for these different plumage uh, uh, phenotypes. Uh, 
and uh, so we performed a, a genetic differentiation scan. We, we calculated FST for, for each variant, and those with uh, high FST, high differ differentiation, are usually taken as candidates um, for, for variants under selection. So these are basically uh, candidates for, for causal mutations between those, um, for causal mutations for pl plumage changes. And um, among the three highest uh, changes we found, there was one particularly promising candidate, uh, namely a, a transposable element insertion, uh, an LTR retrotransposon, um, that inserted um, very closely to a gene called NDP. And interestingly, um, the insertion is fixed in the hooded crow, so in the black and gray forms, you only have this uh, insertion and you don't have the the original, the ancestral type, and uh, it's polymorphic in the black crows. So um, that already speaks for, for some form of selection, but maybe not um, as convincingly yet. But when we then look closer at the region of where that uh, insertion happened, we found two things. The one is that in close proximity, in another study, there was found um, a copy number variable region in pigeons uh, linked to uh, plum plumage variation, so uh, different um, uh, patterns of wings were, were tied to this uh, variant, influencing uh, the NDP gene. And uh, we also found, indicated by the, the purple arrow here, a uh, highly conserved region, um, even like conserved between chicken and human. So speaking for some, um, uh, like indicating some functional um, relevance of this region, which then could influence could could be influenced by the uh, transposable element insertion and then influencing the downstream gene uh, gene expression. And to test that, we then uh, reanalyzed um, previous transcriptome data we produced in the lab. And um, as it turns out, the homozygous LTR um, element insertion is actually tied to um, reduced expression of, of NDP. So here on the left, again, um, uh, the LTR element is, is fixed in hooded crows and polymorphic in, in, the, in the black carrying crows. And if you have the homozygous insertion uh, genotype, you have much reduced uh, gene expression. And if you're heterozygous or um, homozygous ancestral or non-insertion type, that's um, uh, normal levels of expression. So that's um, still not a proof for a causal variant, because for that you basically would need to um, do uh, genetic engineering with crows, and that's uh, very hard to imagine actually. But that's as close as it, is, it gets. And also in another reanalysis, we found that um, with um, admixture map mapping across um, hybrids, we, we also found this um, variant to be closely associated with, with the variation in plumage type. So to conclude here, um, what we did in this study was um, to um, combine different types of sequencing and mapping technologies and found that long read sequencing in particular um, is able to reveal uh, a stunning amount of um, genetic variation. Uh, we came up with a, a scheme or an approach to um, improve the genotypes of structure variants. That's still like an, an ongoing area of, of, um, of bioinformatic uh, research, basically. And um, lastly, we also found a variant which is um, likely a, a good candidate for the phenotypic differences between the black and the, and the black and gray cr crows. And with that, I'm at the end of my talk. I uh, particularly want to thank my two PhD supervisors, Alexander Saw and Jochen Wolf, uh, and then also uh, Valentina Peona, uh, who did um, a large part of the repeat analysis, Fritz Sedlacek, who helped with uh, structure variant calling, and also Ignaz Bunikis, uh, Kezian Francois, uh, Anna Catalan, and Vera Ramut, and you for your attention. Thank you very much.